everyone doing today? I believe that. Very good. It's good to see you today. Nice to be together. Uh, I just want to say welcome uh, to Northbridge today. And there's, I look out, I see a lot of first-time guests today, and I want you to know that you are welcome to be here. We love that you're here. We expect, every week, we expect and know that there will be uh, first-time guests with us. So we say a couple of things just to kind of just to kind of break the ice a little bit, first of all, you probably noticed that our garage door is shut. And now, first of all, how many people have gone to church where you hear that statement uh, in, in worship? Hey, the garage door has been shut in the sanctuary. It's pretty atypical to have a garage door at, nor at a church. I recognize that. Well, we shut our door. That's just so noise and everything. If you need to get up uh, to refill your coffee, get another donut, just follow the exit sign out. You're not trapped in here, I promise, okay? So just because the door's shut, you can go ahead and still exit through the exit door. Also, 
in your bulletin that you received, uh, there is a card that folks that are a part of the congregation, folks that are used to coming to Northbridge, they use that card to uh, sign up for different things. They use that card, that we call it a connection card. We, they use that card to let us know about prayer requests in their lives, things like that. Well, you know, if you're a first, second time guest and we don't know you, you haven't given us any information, one of the things that would be so helpful uh, for us is if we just know who you are and you can just kind of introduce yourself by filling out that connection card, giving us as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. Uh, we promise that we're not going to use that information. We're not going to sell that information to anyone. We're not going to give that information to any other organization. And we're not going to show up on your doorstep unannounced, okay? Uh, what we'll do is we'll put some information about the church and about who we are in the mail to you with a letter, a welcome letter saying, hey, thank you for uh, coming and visiting and, you know, hope to see you again. Uh, but we won't do anything intrusive on you. If you would fill that card out and then on your way out today, just walk over by the giving center and there's a box over there an offertory box, if you just drop that, uh, that card into the offertory box, that's your gift to us. That's your way of helping us out just to get to know you and kind of begin a little conversation. Uh, we, again, are so happy you're here. So excited about uh, what God is doing in the midst of our people as we started a new series last week uh, looking at, basically what we're doing is we're looking at some of the wisdom that, uh, that the book of Proverbs has for us in every day life. We're calling it Lessons from Our Father. I can tell you very shortly, very quickly, I was just out of college. I was reading in Proverbs. There was a book, there was a, a, a section there in which it said to never uh, give lend, uh, never co-sign for someone who's outside of your family, for someone who's outside of your kinfolk, uh, because it's just unwise. And literally two days later, there was a friend of mine who was asking me if I would co-sign for him to be able to get utilities uh, in his apartment. And I just, I just went back to that. And I said, you know, it's just not wise for me to do that. I'm not in a position to do that. Long story short, uh, six months later, he couldn't pay his bills. He left, left the community. And the person that did co-sign for him, which was another friend of ours, ended up having like a $600 bill that he had to cover. I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, for letting me see that book of Proverbs, <laughs> let me see that chapter in Proverbs to help me. There's all kinds of wisdom like that, just found, just practical stuff in the book of Proverbs. And so today, Pastor Mike's going to be joining us and just taking a look at that, taking a snippet of what kind of wisdom can we get uh, in, from Proverbs. So it's going to be an exciting time, a good time, uh, some practical stuff for us. Uh, but in the meantime, I realize we've got almost a full house here, so why don't you stand up to your feet? And there's a chance maybe you don't know somebody here that you need to connect with. Go ahead and say hi to them real quick. Okay, go ahead. You can go. As you're kind of finishing up your conversation, you can take your seat. I tell you what, one of the things I am noting, I'm just feeling in the air a certain electricity, a certain excitement that a lot of people have. And I tell you what, I know I'm not vain enough. I, I'm smart enough to realize it's not because you're in the room with me today. Uh, I know that there is an electricity here and an excitement because there are many families this season that are celebrating some pretty cool things happening in their lives, some transitions. We, we've got some high school seniors moving on into, into college, into the workforce, into trade school. We have some trade school graduates that have graduated. We have some 
folks in college that have graduated. Heck, we even have some uh, folks that are graduating with master's degrees this year. And uh, so right now, we want to just take a couple of minutes to recognize you, recognize your accomplishments. And uh, we've invited Scott. Scott serves the church as our youth minister uh, to, uh, to, to take this time right now to recognize these people. Like Tony said, we just want to take an opportunity as a church body just to come around our, our, our graduates of all levels and just congratulate them uh, for their accomplishments and their hard work. And so um, I have, a, have a, quite a long list this year. So some are going to be in this service, some are going to be in next service, but we want to recognize everybody. And then at the end of this, we want to gather around them and, and pray for them and, and ask the Holy Spirit's blessing upon them. So if you're here this morning... I'm going to ask that you come up on stage, okay? Or actually, why don't you just come, come right down here? And then uh, we'll have everybody come around you. So uh, this, this morning, we're going to start out with uh, our college graduates. Uh, we have Rick Hudson, who is graduating from OTC with his AA. We have uh, Paulette Kitterman uh, graduating from OTC as well. We have uh, Bethany Loya, who's graduating um, from, I think it's Miami University in Florida with her major in uh, marine biology. We have uh, uh, Darian Tracy graduating from OTC with her AA, and, um, and Kayla Tracy gra uh, graduating with his AA from OTC as well. And then we have Eric Schroeder graduating you're graduating with your master's, right? And then we also have our high school graduates we want to recognize as well. We have Austin Pope, and I know he's not here this first service because he's his graduation is today, so he's getting all prepared for that. And then we have uh, Lydia Loya, who graduated from Hillcrest High School. We have Teresa Huntley, who graduated Friday night from Willard. We have Tess Shipley, who also graduated from Willard. And then we have Kara Mullen, who graduated from Hillcrest. And these are our 2014 graduates. I've asked, uh, I've asked Jay Loveland, one of our leadership team members, to come and, and pray, for, pray for our graduates. Uh, and, and just blessings upon, upon them. If you know one of these individuals, let's just spread out, spread out here across the stage. Uh, you want to move on down? And if you know one of these graduates, just come and, and, and just lay a hand upon them. If you pray with me. Father God, first and foremost, we come and give thanks. We thank you for uh, each and one of these graduates, their time, their commitment, their effort that has uh, gone out through this. And uh, God, we just ask for your blessings and your hand of protection upon them as they move forward with their careers or education. God, it's a changing world out there. and. Uh, but we know that the one thing that is rock solid, and that is you. God, I just ask that you would uh, help each one of these individuals in every one of their decisions that they make and all their studies, career opportunities that uh, they go through you, God. Father, thank you. We thank you as a church to be blessed with them. And we do all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and uh, join us in worship this morning.
voices worshiping you uh, with all that we have, God. We love you and it's in your name.
temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my open stake When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my Speak to us now as we open your word, as we hear a word from you, and as you begin to change us, God, from the inside out. We truly need you, God, and we are here and we are listening, Lord. Speak to us in your name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, and let me add my congratulations, graduates, uh, all across the all across the uh, the church family here and in this hour and those online with us on the I campus, uh, what a what a cool just what a cool uh, uh, demarcation, a kind of mile marker in life to be able to shift gears and celebrate that accomplishment. Way to go! Uh, proud of you. We we are proud of you. If you have your Bible or your uh, phone uh, or your tablet or whatever this morning, I'd like for you to open it to the book of Proverbs chapter four. And I'm going to give you some time to find that. We're going to spend some time there this morning in Proverbs chapter four. A few uh, years ago, actually a number of years ago, I went to the doctor, you know, one of those physicals. And, um, I, I hadn't really been really good at that. I mean, this was a number of years ago and I've been really good with that, uh, in the last couple of decades. But back in the young adult years, I hadn't spent a lot of time with that and went, I didn't know a lot about what that was supposed to, you know, be like, and so um, uh, it was an afternoon appointment, and uh, nobody told me about the fasting piece, you know, that you were supposed to do with uh, before you go. So I had uh, had a, gone through some place and had me a nice big Polish sausage dog lunch, and and then went to my physical, and you know, they did the lab work, and and I think w somewhere in the laboratory, all the sirens and bells and whistles went off. You know, my cholesterol came back about a thousand, I think, or something like that. And the doctor came in from my point and said, um, "Now, we, we, you know, we've got a little concern here. Uh, your your cholesterol is not very good. And uh, did did you fast? And why well, fast? What what would I, what's no? I didn't. I didn't fast. So I got to do it over again, and it came back a second time. The second time." Uh, it still had some issues. Uh, still, it wasn't quite, you know, it wasn't a thousand, but it was not where it was supposed to be. And so ever since that time, I've been taking this little pill, you know. Every day for, for a couple of decades now, I take this little pill to keep my, to keep my cholesterol. Why? Why? Because we all know heart disease is the number one killer uh, all all uh, causes of death globally. I, I wasn't sure if that was just a United States deal, but no, it, it's, it's, it's a global deal. In fact, it's more prominent. Uh, it's higher on the ranking of cause of death uh, worldwide than even it is in, in America, followed closely uh, by a stroke, which is also related to that little ticker inside sometimes. Some, sometimes uh, we got a little blood pressure issue or, or, or whatever. So, in order to uh, kind of manage that, we do things to keep our inside of our heart healthy. If I were to ask you how many of you are on, you know, some kind of cholesterol medication or you're watching your diet or your doctor has said cut down on the this or that, 
Now, I won't ask, so it's okay. Don't just go ahead and relax. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But the odds are many of us are traveling that road. Why? Because we, we know we know that, you know, there's not, uh, now that we can, I guess, replace hearts today. I, 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 I've seen and folks that have had that done, and that's kind of cool. It's still a pretty big deal. And uh, protecting our heart on the inside from disease is really, really important. Would everyone agree? Okay? So just help me out here. Just turn to whoever's, whoever's next to you and just say, now protect your heart. Okay? Just tell them. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, protect your heart. Or you need to protect your heart. Uh, uh, the doctor says you need to protect your heart. So we get that on the inside. We, we get that. You know, we, we're, we're tracking with that. We've got that down. It's a part of our, kind of become a part of our culture now. To maybe watch our diet or, you know, maybe not. At least, can we agree on this? We know we're supposed to watch our diet, okay? We know we're supposed to take care. We know we're supposed to do some things to make the inside of our heart healthy. But beyond that, I was also thinking about this issue of heart and protecting your heart and thought, uh, you know, externally, externally, we give extra attention to protecting our heart as well. Um, I, uh, I was, uh, uh, in fact, I text uh, Eric Schroeder, our uh, resident police officer, and asked him if he had a, this morning, and asked him if he had a, a flak jacket because it occurred to me, it occurred to me that uh, <laughs> law enforcement, military, uh, they go into areas where they may be at risk of weaponry, getting shot, getting stabbed, whatever. Uh, there, there are a lot of parts that they will allow to be exposed, okay? But there's one, I think I got it on backwards because it's supposed to be like heavy in the butt, so that wouldn't, that wouldn't help me. My backside would be very, very protected there, would it not? There we go. There we go. Now, see, uh, on first glance, if on first glance, I would think about wearing something like this into a dangerous situation, into a military conflict or a place where bullets might be flying. Man, I still got a lot of things exposed here. You know, where's the rest of this? I mean, I can get shot in the arm or the leg or, you know, uh, uh, someplace else. Yeah, what? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> but what we figured out is what? I can get shot in the arm, get shot in the leg, get stabbed, you know, in the thigh. I, 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 can, I can take some wounds to a lot of places and survive. There's one place I can't take a wound and likely survive. One time, that, one place that if I take a wound there, the, I, the chance of being fatal is very, very high. And that would be? Yeah. Guard your heart. We protect our heart. And so we got the cholesterol pills going down the inside. We got the exercise going. We got the diet going. We got the flat jacket when we go into dangerous situations. We guard in our heart. If you're in Proverbs chapter 4, I want you to look at verse 32 with me. And let me tell you what's happening in verse 32. At 23, verse 23. See that. Some of you are already on the ball here because you realize there's no 32 verses in the book of Proverbs. For the first three, book, first three chapters in this writing, Solomon, regarded as the wisest man, remember Solomon's story? God asked him, What can I give you? You know, as you move to power, and, you know, wealth, fame, obviously you're going to be king. Uh, Solomon said, Give me wisdom. And, and God gave him wisdom regarded as one of the wisest men ever to have walked on the planet. And Solomon's putting some writings and some teachings together in the first three chapters. He's kind of unpacking some things to pay attention to. And in the fourth chapter, he begins to urge us. And if you, if you just glance through the rest of the verses in the, in the first part of that chapter, the first 22 verses, what you see is several times Solomon saying, please listen to me. Please listen to me. Heed my words. What I'm sharing with you I have learned from the heart of God and through life's lessons. Listen to my words. And you shift gears and you get to verse 23 and listen to what it says. Above all else, 
above all of the other things I'm going to tell you, and above all of the other ways, the ideas, the tips, the, the teachings, the instructions, the, the warnings, above all else you read here in my writings, hear me hear, what is it? Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from that. Now, just a moment ago, we were talking about this, you know, muscle inside our body that we recognize. Man, I got to protect. I got to do some stuff on the inside and keep the cholesterol down and the exercise so that thing stays healthy. Because I got one of them, and when it goes, I goes. Okay, I mean. And then we've got to protect ourselves on the outside. We thank you for people that go put themselves in harm's way, like Eric and law enforcement, first responders, military. But and, and when they do that, they, they go out there at great risk to themselves. And, and while there's a lot of other things that can wound, we want to guard their heart. We get that. And we get that. We know we're talking about this muscle. When we shift gears to what Solomon is telling us about, what he's describing is another piece of who we are that we get one shot at. We get one. It is the essence, this, this word, this, this phrase that he uses is one of the most common words throughout Scripture to describe who we are as mankind. It's, it's the emotional, the intellectual, the moral core of who we are. What makes us who we are is this word that's translated into the English language, heart. But it's something not about the muscle, but about us. About how we think and feel and experience and our values and what's important and how we make decisions and choices. It's the core of who we are. And Solomon says, as you listen to all of the things I'm going to teach you, above all else, Hear this one. Guard your heart. Because everything about you, every choice, every decision, every emotion, literally, will flow from that heart. Wow. I mean, when you think about it, it's a, it's a pretty powerful statement on on Solomon's part to, to declare, man, if you, it's kind of like the teacher, you know, or sometimes when we're on the platform and we'll say, okay, you know, we're going to talk for, for 30 minutes here, but, but if you only get one thing, get this one. I mean, that's kind of what's coming from Solomon's mouth here. If you only get one thing out of my whole writing, out of all of my writings about the wisdom of life and, and how to track with God in life, get this one. Guard your heart. It's a... Uh, it's, it's kind of the same, uh, same concept that Apostle Paul talked about in Ephesians 6 when, when he tells us to pay attention to, to the battle that we're in. He's describing life as, as a battle. In fact, there's a lot of places in the Bible that kind of uses the analogy of, of war or a war zone or a battle or a conflict to describe how we walk through this life. And, and Paul in Ephesians 6 says, as you go through life, I want you to put on some armor. <laughs> And he talks about various pieces of armor that do guard the rest of us. Metaphorically, he talks about parts of our bodies and the kind of spiritual armor that we put on. And he gets to one piece, the heart, that one place that has to be guarded. And he says, put on this breastplate of righteousness, of holiness, of purity. Now, let me, let me pause and make a confession. There's one thing that always scares me a little bit when we have these kinds of conversations and we begin to talk about holiness and righteousness and purity because I think the natural tendency is for us to think in our own minds, whew, boy, that train's left station for me. I mean, I've already, I've already missed that one. I've already missed that boat. It's already sailed. I, you know, right, uh, uh, purity, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, you know, I've already failed. I want you to hear this this morning. And, you know, maybe for me, uh, as Solomon says, above all else, here, here's my above all else this morning. When you know God through faith in Jesus Christ, when we give our life to Him through confession and repentance 
and commitment. When we call out and say, God, you're in charge, kind of like Jim did back on Easter. Uh, I've been trying to do it for, you know, I, I don't remember how many years he said, 70, 60 some years, 70 some years. I've been trying to do it, and God, I let you take control from now, okay? When we do that, when we do that, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, washes over our failures. It removes our past missteps, our impurities. When we talk about purity and holiness, here's what we're talking about. We're not talking about past failures. Past failures do not dictate current success. Do you hear me? Past failures do not have to be the determinant to how I will experience victory in this moment. When we're talking about how to guard our heart, here's what a piece I want you to grab a hold of. We're talking about winning this moment. This moment. Right now. And whatever it is when you face the issues that we're going to unpack in the next couple of moments. It's not about have you failed in the past or will you fail in that way in the future. It's not about that. It's about winning the battle here in that moment today. And then the next one, when it comes, we'll deal with that. Does that make sense? Because if we don't take that view, we're just going to start off with a teaching like this and say, you know, it's too late for me. I've already missed the purity piece. I've already missed the, the holiness boat. Righteousness is not attainable for me. I know my failties, frailties. I know my failings. Our goal is always to win the moment, to win this specific battle. See, the reality is that we continue to be in, 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 in Bible uses the analogy battle, and it's a great description of this life. Now, the truth of the matter is the war is won. Are you with me? The war is won, okay? I mean, God declared Jesus victor when he died and stayed dead for three days and had a little conversation. <laughs> I doubt it was that, but whatever happened in those three days with God's enemy and our enemy. Say, when, whatever went on there, and then Jesus conquered death, paid price for our sin, and God declared Jesus victor. The battle is won, okay? The war is won. But we're in this season between the victory declared and the sensation of hostilities. Are you with me? Okay, We're, we're caught in this season. I, was, I, I saw an article, a news article, actually, a couple months ago that caught my attention. There was uh, evidently an, uh, an Imperial Japanese Army official who had continued for... 29 years following World War II to wage a guerrilla battle, refusing to surrender, even though the war was won, even though it was over. For 29 years, in an island in the Philippines, he continued to wage this guerrilla battle. His name was, I'm going to butcher it, and, but it's okay. You don't know any different anyway. It's, you know, it's Haru, Haru uh, uh, Anoda, okay? Yeah, there we go. Haru Anoda. And for 29 years, he continued this military battle until in 1974, on March 9th, his former commander met him in an isolated place somewhere on the island and convinced him that the war was over. And the reason it made the news recently is because he passed away at the age of 91 here back in January of this year. And that kind of brought back this story. We're in that 29-year period, if you will, between the battle being... The, the, the war being won and the cessation of hostilities. Now, make no, make no mistake. There's going to come a moment, the Bible describes it, when God's going to say, okay, let's have a little meeting. Uh, we're done. Okay? We're done. Now, the Bible describes that in a lot of different ways. You know, Jesus is going to come back. But, but however it happens, however it happens, God's going to say, okay, we're done. You're done. Go away. And I got a spot for you, by the way. But in the meantime, even though the battle for our soul is won, we continue in hostility. And it's this journey of, of, of continually fighting against an old nature and against an enemy that keeps throwing things into our face and keeps us from being able to sustain a walk of holiness and purity 
and righteousness that we have to deal with. And it's in that context that Proverbs says, Solomon says, guard your heart. You're in battle. Guard your heart. Put on this, put on this protection that will guard that which is most valuable to you, the essence of who you are. He gives us, uh, he gives us some ideas of how, how to do that. And as we read through the rest of the verses in the, left in that chapter, let me just suggest three things that I see quickly in Solomon's writings that will help us to guard our heart. And in Solomon's style, one of the things I love about Solomon's writings is they're, you know, they're pretty plain spoken. They're kind of, Solomon might have been an Ozarkian, I don't know. You know <laughs> if, I mean, it's just kind of plain spoken. He, he just kind of says it the way it is. There's not a lot of theological uh, jargon you got to unpack with Solomon. You you just kind of he just kind of says, hey, hey hey pay attention to this, hey, hey, stay away from that. And when you move through verses twenty four through twenty six, I want you to watch at what he says. Now he's declared, please listen to me. That's what he said. He said it multiple times in this chapter. Please listen to me. Above all else that you hear, guard your heart. And then he unpacks it in verse twenty four. He says. I'll just say it the way he says it, I think. Watch your mouth. <laughs> Watch your mouth. Uh, don't say this to each other, okay? But just go ahead and say it to me. Ready? Here we go. Oh, Watch your mouth. Okay. Now, yeah, I think I will. I, I was trying to think, should I really ask that? You know, have any of you ever had somebody in your all of your life, maybe childhood, tell you to watch your mouth? Yeah? <laughs> Uh, yeah, a few, a few brave souls came up. Here, let me ask it this way. Have any of you said to someone else, maybe a child or a grandchild, watch your mouth? Yeah, I got a few more hands that time. Uh-huh. Watch your mouth. Look at what he says. Verse 24. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. I, uh, I looked through the rest of Proverbs and, and I found a number of places where Solomon cautioned us about our mouth, about our tongue. In chapter 18, verse 21, he said, the tongue has the power of life and death. In chapter 13, verse 3, he said, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly come to ruin. Jesus Himself, when he was teaching and Matthew was recording in Matthew chapter 12, he said, For by your words you are acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Want to guard your heart? Protect the essence of who you are? <coughs> Solomon says, watch your mouth. Watch what you say. I think there's a couple of thoughts here, and I, I looked at several translations of how they have interpreted the original language of what the Solomon was writing. And I think one of the pieces clearly was that we need to learn to be honest in our talk. Be honest with what we say. Here, here's a translation from the uh, New Contemporary Version. It says this. It says, don't use your mouth to tell lies. Don't ever say things that are not true. Now, that's, that's pretty plain. That's pretty clear. Be honest. Be honest. I, I love the story of the, of the preacher who announced to his congregation, now, next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching on sin. And so uh, just to help me kind of get a head start and help you get a jump start on thinking about what we're going to be talking about, what I'd like for you all to do is read Mark 17. If you could just, you know, it's a short chapter, just read Mark 17, and, uh, and next week we'll come, and uh, we'll, I, I want to talk with you about what the Bible says about sin. And so the next week to ride, and the, you know, they had, had, uh, had some other elements in the first part of the service. The pastor got up, and as he began his talk, he, he said, now, how many, how many of you have read? Uh, Mark 17. About two-thirds of the hands went up in the congregation. About, about two-thirds of the congregation raised their hand. He kind of smiled and said, very good, very good. Mark has 16 chapters. And so now let's begin our message this morning on sin and lying. <laughs> Jesus said, uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just be honest. In my role as an administrator in the school district, I uh, have an opportunity to have a conversation with a lot of folks who, you know, might kind of wander off the policy manual or handbook in one way or another. And 
what I have said to them from time to time is, you know, j just be honest with me. I can probably help you. Maybe we can navigate through this. But the moment I recognize that you, you, you're not being honest with me, we, we don't really have any place to go. There's not a whole lot there to work with. Are you with me? That's kind of what Solomon would say. The moment you wander off that path of losing your own integrity and your own trustworthiness, there's not a whole lot to work with. You talk about a heart exposed at that point. I mean, the essence of who you are is vulnerable at that point. It's the foundation. I mean, this one piece is the foundation of life. So foundational, it's one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's the Ninth Commandment. Don't bear false witness. Watch your mouth. Be honest. Just, just say what is true. In Proverbs 6, Solomon writing about things that God hates. This is interesting. If you look at that list in Proverbs 6, he, he writes about, he says, six things that God hates. Seven things are detestable to him. And then he starts going down through this list. And if you look at the list, he used lying twice. <laughs> so I guess that's how I got the, from the six to the seven. He said, let me say this one again. D you know, don't, don't lie. It's listed twice in the same list. And Jesus himself spoke to it. I, I said a moment ago in Matthew 5, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Clearly, just your own integrity and your own truthfulness and your own honesty. But here's another piece of this watch your mouth that I caught when I was reading, especially different translations and different uh, folks' take on the passage. It was not just be honest, but there was clearly an implication here. To, uh, quit gossiping. Quit gossiping. Uh, listen to this translation from Eugene Peterson in The Message. He said, don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Avoid careless banter, white lies, and what? <laughs> I love the... I love the story of the four preachers that were uh, together in a coffee shop, and they were just talking and saying, you know, people come to us, and they ask us for counsel and wisdom and, and, uh, and confess to us, and, and, and I mean, we're, we don't really have any place to go. Maybe we should all confess to one another, you know. I mean, yeah, that, we, we should do that, kind of help hold each other accountable. So they began. They went around the table, and the first one confessed that, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he, he really – He'd sneak away and, and kind of had a little taste for gambling, and it had kind of become a thing with him. And, and he was concerned about where that was going in his life. And another one kind of began to share, and he said he, he, he kind of had began to, began to struggle with just being, being honest. He found himself kind of stretching the truth a little bit sometimes in conversations, and that, that concerned him. And, and the third one got to the third one, and he said, man, I, you know, I found myself uh, just when I'm at home at night by myself, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tune in some movies that just aren't really appropriate or helpful for me. They, they take me away from God, not toward him. And, and they kind of continued around the conversation, got to the fourth guy, and the fourth guy didn't say anything. And, you know, of course, the other three, now, look, now we've, you know, we've shared here. You know, what, 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 what's yours? And after just a moment, he said, mine is gossiping, and I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You see, here's what happens with gossiping. We, we all know this. Knowledge is power. It feels powerful when we know something, especially if we know something other people don't. Am I right? And so when we're in this situation, we're in this story, and I, I love the way we do it in the church, you know, in, particular, in the Christian community. We'll, we'll kind of do it in the, in, the, in the context of a prayer request. The only problem is we usually forget to pray about the circumstance. It's just kind of telling the story, you know. And so we begin to tell the story, and, oh, you know, so I, didn't, I didn't realize that or didn't know that. And we find ourselves caught up talking about stuff that really we don't need to talk about. It's not helpful. Here's a, here's a helpful tip for you. If this is one of the things that maybe you struggle with, maybe one of the cracks in your vest of guarding your heart, put this one down. Ask yourself anytime you're about to have a conversation or you find yourself engaged, do I know this is true? Is it fair? And is it necessary? Do I know it's true? And is it fair? And is it necessary? Is there any value coming out of this? I'm, I mean, sometimes it's helpful to, to share a prayer need among the group that's going to keep that in confidence and pray about that. That's, that's helpful. That's clearly not what we're talking about here. Solomon says, you want to guard your heart? I mean, if you don't get anything else, he says, if you miss all of the other tips to living, all of the other instructions of God, guard your heart, then watch your mouth. Be careful what comes out. He moves on and he says this. You want to guard your heart, you've got to pay attention to this one. Don't look. Don't look. Look at what he says, verse 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead. 
Fix your gaze directly before you. See, here's a here's a reality. Our eyes can be one of the most treacherous parts of our body. I mean, our eyes can our eyes can literally betray us on a regular basis when it comes to the task of trying to guard our heart and protect us. There are generally two things that kind of catch our catch our imagination, catch our fancy: envy, envy, or lust. Envy, man, I. Man, I envy. Man, I want that. Man, I wish I had that. Man, look what they had. Man, I wish we had one of those. Man, I wish I had their place. Man, I wish I had his car. Man, I wish I had that fish. Man, uh, or lust. And we, our eyes catch something. And in fact, in fact, if you read the rest of Proverbs, what you'll find is that's one of the issues that Solomon continually circles back to about our eyes betraying us because it is... They are, they are so treacherous in that regard, so traitorous in that regard. See, when we see something, we think, man, our mind thinks, I want that. And, and when that happens, we're in a dangerous place. The Bible calls it temptation. And we suddenly find ourselves in this moment where we are tempted, where our eyes see something and we want that. And we know we're in a dangerous place. But the reality is we all are there. I mean, we all are there. The Bible's clear about that. All of us, all of us are there. All of us deal with temptation. There's no temptation around that's not common to every other person. Now, all of us aren't tempted with all temptations, but the reality is all of us are tempted in some way. James tells us to resist the devil. When he's saying that, he's talking about the fact that we are still in the season between the Victory won and the cessation of hostilities. We're still in that span before God has the conversation and says, quit. You're done with the enemy. We're still in that span. And so because of that, we are still subject to, to the arrows of the enemy. And the Bible says, James tells us, hey, you, you need to keep battling. Keep resisting. Don't give in to that. Don't give up. Don't let your mind get to some place where you say, I can't win that. I can't get over that hump. I can't get past that. Don't go there. Keep fighting. Keep battling. Keep resisting. But when he comes to this particular strategy that the enemy uses, temptation, the Bible's clear. It says run. <laughs> run. Flee temptation. Get out of that circumstance. Change your thinking. Change your setting. Change your mind. Go someplace else. Think something different. As we've talked about this here before, I have suggested the one second rule. It's helpful here, okay? You got one second to see something. Envy, lust, whatever it is. You got one second, and then in, within that second, you need to shift gears, pivot to something. Pivot to something. Get up, change places. Get up and go to the other room. Get up and... and Go get a cup of coffee. That's what I do. Go grab a good cup of your favorite coffee. Do something, but take yourself out of that environment. Second Timothy tells us to run literally anything when we encounter that temptation. Get out of there. Don't look. Stop. Go the other direction. One second. And here's the deal. What I said a moment ago, forget what you, where you failed in this in the past. Forget that. I mean, that's past. Ask for forgiveness, the blood of Jesus. If you know Christ, if you know God through your personal faith in Christ, the blood of Jesus covers that and cleanses that and erases that. Forget the past. Win that moment. That's all you have to focus on is win that moment. And if you win that moment, you are guarding your heart. It is that much stronger when the next moment comes. Are you with me? Don't worry about the next moment. You can't do anything about them anyway. You don't know when they're coming. You don't know where they're going to be. You don't know what your circumstances are going to Don't worry about the next moments. Just win that moment. Just win that little skirmish. And in doing so, guard your heart, Solomon says. Here's the last thing he says, and we're done. He says, I want you to stay away. I want you to stay away. Verse 26, give careful thought to the paths of your feet. And be steadfast in all of your ways. 
Don't turn to the right or turn to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Don't wander, but here's what he said. Don't wander behind enemy lines and make yourself vulnerable. When you find yourself in settings that are not going to align with the heart of God for you, stay away. Get away from them. Man, this, this applies to choosing friends. I'm going to tell you something. Once in a while, I'll hear a young person say, you know, well, I'm going to stay a part of that group so that I can influence them for God. When there's more than one, if, if, if it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship and you're always with a person, you've got a good shot with the power of God in you to influence them. If you're finding yourself hanging out with more than one person who does not share your faith or values, the odds are better that they're going to influence you than you them. Are you with me? Choose your friends carefully. I embrace, we embrace connecting with someone who is far from God and loving them and serving them and showing them what it looks like to walk with God. You're not perfect. We know that. We're still in the war. We're still in the battle, still in this season. And hostilities haven't ceased yet. You're battling just like that. But, but, but that's great. Build that relationship. Show them that God loves them and has a plan for their life. But if you find yourself in a group of folks who don't share your values, the odds are you're going to slide toward them, not pull all of them towards you. Be careful how you choose your friends. Be careful of the places you go. Stay away from places that don't align with God's heart. You guard your heart, he says. Choose those activities wisely. All of us struggle. I, I want you to know this. All of us struggle here. We are all still in the war. We are all still in the battle. We are all still vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. All of us could walking down a path and suddenly guerrilla warfare out of our flank position. I don't know what that means, but I, I think it's supposed to be something pretty, you know, I don't, pretty strategic, you know, okay. And boom, there it is, and we're caught up in this battle. Why? Jesus already did it. And then, well, yeah, because we're, God hasn't yet had the conversation. We're in this period. Of hostilities haven't ceased. All of us are subject to that. Uh, just a couple years ago, we had a young man that was one of our interns who was doing some prep for one of our messages, and he wrote on a sheet of paper for me. He said, the best way, um, the best way to remove a vice is to replace it with a virtue to cultivate a virtue. Let, let me give you a suggestion. Find something that helps you when you find yourself tempted away from purity, away from guarding your heart. Here, here's an idea. The Bible says the word of God is powerful. Quote a scripture in the, in the whispers of your mind. You say, Mike, I don't know any scriptures. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. 1 John 4, 8. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. Look at there. Look at there. Memorize a scripture this morning. God, if that's the only one you know, maybe John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him should not perish. When you find yourself in that moment, in that one second, in that one second, pull out God as love and just say that thing about 20 times. See, here, listen to me. All you need is a few seconds to move away from whatever it is that's about to suck you in. And in those few seconds will be the difference in having this on and having this off. And the heart of who you are vulnerable to the enemy. Just a few seconds. Maybe for you it won't be a scripture. It'll be a song. Maybe it'll be a saying. Something you can pivot to. But in that moment, remove that vice by replacing it, by cultivating something that's virtuous in our life. Guarding your heart in that moment. Listen to me. Guarding your heart in that moment is worth it. I want you to remember Jesus' words. Matthew 5 records in the very beginning of his ministry. He's about to launch his public ministry, and he's doing his very first teaching publicly. And he goes through this list of things that pleases God and that makes us happy and that brings God's blessing to us. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are guarding their heart, winning this moment because they will see. That's my prayer for you today, this week. It's my prayer for me as I battle today and this week. And God will help me to be pure in the moment, to win the next moment that comes my way, that I may see his work 
in my life. God, thank you for your word that is powerful and sharper, strong. And here you use Solomon to help us to understand the urgency of guarding our heart, of experiencing purity and holiness and righteousness just moment by moment of winning, skirmish by skirmish in this battle. And when we just give you a couple of seconds, God, you come swooping in with your protection. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Help us as we continue to press toward you and warn your ways. We love you and thank you for your great love for us in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand together and sing this closing song with the band. Oh, 
Amen, yes. It's appropriate to clap and applaud, saying thank you, God, for this. I'll tell you what, one of the things that Pastor Mike, as he was sharing, that just came to my mind is this week, as I go about uh, just living in the world, just dealing with what we have to deal with and going to the places we have to go with in our job and our family and all those things, the whisper that I'm going to be sharing and saying to God uh, and uttering to God throughout the week is just, God, uh, check my heart and empower me to be pure. Empower me to be pure in the moment that I find myself in. And I challenge you to, to utter a prayer, some, something like that, say, whisper a prayer, something like that uh, in your life as well. Hey, as we're ready to head out today, uh, man, I'm so happy you're here. This was such a good day today. This was a good service and a good experience. I'm, I just, I feel so blessed that you were a part of it as well. Um, know this: next week is Memorial Day weekend, and so a lot of our folks are traveling or out of town. And so, what we're going to do to help accommodate those travels and those and those uh, gathering points, we're going to have one service on Sunday at 10:30 a.m. Okay. So if you show up at your regular time, you're going to be eating an extra donut, drinking an extra cup of coffee as we're waiting for service to start at 1030. Okay, so you'll want to be a part of that. May you experience the purity of Christ today in a real and living way. May you be the salt in the light in the world as you reflect the purity of Christ in and through your life. Go in peace. You're dismissed. Have a great day. is made every day I choose my fate and I wonder